Hello, it's Scott Manley here. After years of preparation, construction and testing, the Lucy spacecraft is ready for launch in time for its launch window, which opens on October 16th. This tiny 800 kilogram spacecraft is going to ultimately fly by six different distinct targets in interplanetary space. That's a record. But first, it has to launch on top of an Atlas V-401 from Cape Canaveral in Florida. The 401 is the smallest rocket that ULA is now selling. It is a, an Atlas V core with no solid rocket motors. And in fact, that Atlas V core that's going to fly is the same one that was originally going to launch the Starliner, except Boeing Starliner had some technical issues and has been shipped back for repairs. So this booster has been shifted over to the next mission since it was ready to go. So the launch window for this grand tour opens on Saturday. It's uh, 23 days long, I believe, but this is a very reliable rocket, so the only thing I'm really expecting might slow it down would be weather. After launch, the spacecraft will deploy, and I said it's an 800 kilogram spacecraft, but at launch it's more like one and a half tons because it has a significant amount of propellant on board. Now, during this ambitious tour of the solar system, its orbit will carry it out to the same distance as Jupiter, and out there the sun is very weak and distant, so it needs very large solar panels to collect enough power to keep the, the system operational. While the spacecraft is designed to fit into a 4 meter fairing on top of the rocket, when those panels unfold it will be 14 and a half meters across or 46 feet, which is you know, a pretty substantial piece of hardware. From launch through to the final encounter, the mission plan is about 12 years long. The first asteroid that will be encountered is in 2025, and that's a small main belt object called Donald Johansson. And in 2033, they will make the final fly past of the mission, uh, past the binary asteroid of Patroclus and Minotius, which is in the trailing Lagrange point behind Jupiter. So what sets Lucy apart from other asteroid missions? I mean, other asteroid missions have orbited and landed on asteroids, and one of them has even shot it with an anti-tank weapon and returned a sample. Well, scholars of science may know the name Donald Johansson, and they may know the name Lucy, and will remember that Lucy is the name given to a skeleton of an ancient human about 3.2 million years ago, and it was discovered by Donald Johansson. So this fossilized skeleton is hugely important to understanding the evolution of the human race, and the people behind the Lucy mission believe that studying the Trojan asteroids will give them important clues to the evolution of the solar system. So the principal investigator is a guy called Hal Levinson, and 25 years ago when I was studying astronomy, I, I heard that name regularly because people would use his software, Swift, to calculate the orbits of asteroids for you know durations of thousands, millions, billions of years even. He studied solar system orbital mechanics, and he's part of a group that developed what is now known as the Nice model for the formation of the solar system. So the Trojans are a group of asteroids which are trapped into one-to-one -one orbital resonance relative to Jupiter, which means they cluster 60 degrees ahead and behind of Jupiter in its orbit. They are held in this place by the interaction of Jupiter's gravity and the Sun's gravity. So not only can they not escape, but because you can play these things backwards and get the same physics, it means that you can't actually capture new items into this group. And that means that everything that was in there had to have formed close to Jupiter in Jupiter's orbit at around the same time as Jupiter. Therefore, we thought that the Trojans had to all be the same. But telescope analysis shows that there are many different kinds of asteroids in the Trojan group. Therefore, they couldn't have formed near Jupiter. But the Nice model of solar system formation has an answer. In that model, the outer planets actually significantly change their orbits, including Jupiter moving inwards. And as it moves inwards, the one-to-one -one resonances also move inwards with it. And in doing that, it can capture a bunch of new objects, which were previously minding their own business, and now they're being put in their place by Jupiter. So that's an argument as to why the Trojan asteroids are a particularly interesting group of objects to study. But let's talk about the specific asteroids that are being visited. First up is Donald Johansson, which is actually not a Trojan. It's a main belt asteroid. It's very small, but it just happened to be 
roughly in the right place that they could very easily get to it and test the instruments on the way out to the asteroid belt. Until relatively recently, this was known just by the number 52246, but when it became a target for the Lucy mission, it got the name Donald Johansson to you know, obviously call out to the individual who discovered the Lucy fossil. So it's the smallest primary target, it's about four kilometers across, it's a C-type carbonaceous asteroid, and it's believed that this is a collisional fragment of uh, an asteroid called Erigone. So we have asteroid families, and these are objects on very similar orbits that all possibly came from a larger collision with a, a single body. The first Trojan to be visited is Eurybates, and it's about 64 kilometers across. It's also a C-type asteroid, and it's part of a collisional family too, the only collisional family in the Trojans, but it is believed to be the parent body, the largest surviving fragment. And it also has a tiny moon named Keta, which is about one kilometer across, but this moon was only discovered after they started doing some analysis for the Lucy mission to make sure that they knew everything. You know, they were, for example, looking to see if there were rings or other dust clouds which could be a danger to the spacecraft. But an important thing to realize here is that image on the top right, that's what we see. That spinning body in the middle, that is our artist's impression of what it is before the Lucy spacecraft can get close enough to actually tell us what it really looks like. Next up in 2027, we have Polymele, which is going to be the smallest target on this flight. It's only 21 kilometers across, but unlike the previous ones, this is a P-type asteroid, which is a much rarer kind. It's believed that these are uh, have a lot more space-weathered organics on the surface, but this is going to be a chance to get up close and find out. In April 2028, they'll encounter Lucas, which is a 40 kilometer D-type asteroid that is a very slow rotator, so this image is not correct. And like all the other objects have rotational periods that are a fraction of a day, this takes uh, 440 hours to rotate. In November 2028, it'll fly by Oris, which is another D-type object. It's slightly larger, about 51 kilometers, and its rotation rate is much more sensible. Now, after this encounter, the spacecraft will return to Earth for another gravity assist, and about six years later, it will arrive and fly past Patroclus and Minotius. This is a large binary-type object. And the thing is, binary asteroids are thought to form out in the Kuiper Belt in the very early solar system, but they tend to get broken apart into individual components. So finding two of them together like this is a very rare opportunity. In fact, the original mission planning didn't expect to be able to reach this because its inclination was so high. Uh, but it was just luck that the timing of the mission meant that the spacecraft would be passing through the right region of space as the asteroid was passing through there, and so they were able to get to this rare binary asteroid. Now there's the matter of getting there. The Bayer Atlas V can't throw the spacecraft all the way to Jupiter, so it uses a couple of gravity assists from the Earth to get there. Initially, it launches away from the Sun, and it comes back to Earth a year later, gets a gravity assist there, and that changes the period of the satellite or the spacecraft to two years. So it comes back in 2024, it gets another gravity assist. It encounters Donald Johansson on its way out in uh, April of 2025. And then in 2027 and 2028, that's when it starts the encounters. Eurybates, Polymele, Eulutius, and Oris, all the way through uh, 2028. It then falls back in for another gravity assist, which will then adjust its orbit for the final encounter with the Patroclus and Minotius in 2033. There are five major maneuvers and it requires a total delta V of about 1.7 kilometers per second to do all this. I had to do a bit of digging to figure out what kind of engine it uses. There was this press release from Aerojet Rocketdyne which told us what kind of engines uh, they provided for it. Now these are small monopropellant hydrazine thrusters. These are primarily going to be used for attitude control, but they might be used for some maneuvers. The main engine is the Leros 1C Apogee engine, which is built by a British company, and that uses hydrazine and mixed oxygen of an oxides of nitrogen to uh, get a pretty high specific impulse for the big maneuvers. But really, all the work has been done to make sure this uses the least amount of delta V possible and gets as many targets for it. 
Uh, I've read a couple of different papers on this, and there's all there's all sorts of very cool little uh, tricks that they've used here and there to actually you know try to find the best route. And I love the fact that one of the papers specifically has Brian Sutter. His job title is totally awesome trajectory genius. And remember, the principal investigator Hal Levison is somebody that knows his way around orbital mechanics. Now, it's worth also taking a moment to take a look at the orbit in the rotating reference frame of Jupiter. So on the left, we have what the orbit looks like in your real space. On the right, what we're doing is we're rotating the camera to keep Jupiter at the top, right? And you'll notice that because Jupiter's at the top, because we're rotating, at some points we're rotating faster than the spacecraft is orbiting and therefore it appears to move backwards. And of course, because it's moving so slowly, it falls back and then switches around and flies up to the other side, making this double lobed pattern. And it's worth noting that at the end of the mission, it's in a six year orbit, which will bring it back down to Earth about three years after the end of the mission. So it could potentially, with course correction, pick up another Earth gravity assist and go on to a new target if that presents itself. So anyway, the Lucy spacecraft has a central core bus with the high gain antenna, it has two, the two large solar panels on either side, and then the instrument platform can be turned and pointed independently of the rest of the spacecraft, so they don't need to lose energy efficiency on those solar panels due to having to point the spacecraft to track uh, an asteroid as it flies by. The spacecraft has three different scientific instruments, and all of them are based on instruments which flew on previous spacecraft. So. Ralph was one of the cameras that flew on New Horizons. Now there's L Ralph, which is the next generation. It's about three times the size. It has better capabilities all round. It has onboard memory, which means they can take images and collect data faster, which is really important when your mission is all about flybys. Now this is actually two different instruments in one. There's a visible imaging camera, right? The MVIC, multiple, multispectral visible imaging camera. And there's also an infrared spectrometer called LISA. And what happens is the light comes in and there's a beam splitter that splits the infrared in one direction, the visible light in the other. And that means they can share the primary optics and of course save mass. The second instrument is L LORI, which is based on the LORI imager from New Horizons. LORI is the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager. It's a long focal length telescope which is able to resolve high, you know, small details. So I think the resolution works out to be about 15 meters at 1000 kilometers. But unlike the color camera in RALPH, this is monochromatic. It works in a broad range of visible light. Since L. Lorry has really good low light performance, it can see faint objects and it has such high angular resolution, they can actually use this to help navigate the spacecraft and look for potential hazards like ring systems around some of these asteroids, which may not be visible from ground based scopes. The third instrument is LTES. That's based on the thermal emission spectrometer, which was flown on board Osiris Rex. This produces a, a thermal spectrum from a single point. It's not an imager. You point it at a thing and it will get you a 10 millirad uh, sample, like in terms of radians. So a, a thousand kilometers, that's a 10 kilometer square area. And it can generate these point spectra at the rate of up to two per second. Now these changing spectra can be used to actually get an idea of the thermal inertia of the material. That is, when the sun illuminates a material, it will heat up and it will tend to heat up faster if it has poor thermal conductivity. And the kind of thing that could be have poor thermal conductivity could be a loosely bound gravel, as opposed to a piece of solid rock, which will tend to conduct the heat inside it faster. Now, this instrument has a component which has a really interesting a cultural link to the name of the mission. The Lucy fossil skeleton was named after Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, the song by the Beatles. Well, it turns out that one of the optical components is a 39 millimeter wide by one millimeter thick diamond. Now, this is a manufactured diamond. It was created in a lab to act as a, an optical component. It acts as a beam splitter. But yes, a week from now, hopefully, there will be Lucy in the Sky with the diamond. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.